38 trillion microbes separated from 70% of the immune system by a single layer of cells that we call the epithelial layer. And so the question was, are they intertwined? And what I've discovered is that as of the writing fiber field, every single autoimmune and allergic disease in which they had studied what was going on in the gut microbiome, every single one of them, the answer was the gut is abnormal. Mm. The gut has been harmed. When you disrupt the gut, the word that I would use is dysbiosis, but some out there might call it this call this leaky gut, and we're basically mm -hmm. talking about the same thing. What we have is a loss of the good guys, the enrichment of the bad guys, and the injury to the lining of the intestine, such that there's basically like it's like you're creating holes in the lining of the intestine. Mm -hmm. Welcome to episode 15 of the Get the Stuck Out podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Austin Perlmutter, and today I'm thrilled that we will be joined by Dr. Will Bulsowitz. He is a gastroenterologist. He is a New York Times bestselling author of the book Fiber Fueled. He is a peer-reviewed researcher. He's also an international expert on the subject of gut health. He's probably one of the most interesting people when it comes to speaking on the subject of the gut and how it relates to our health. In this powerful episode of Get the Stuck Out, Dr. Bulsowitz, who goes by Dr. B, will explain the vital role of the microbiome and the gut in our overall health. He'll talk about the key role of fiber. We'll talk about the difference between the ketogenic diet versus something like a plant-based diet for health. We'll talk about prebiotics. We'll talk about probiotics. We'll talk about postbiotics. We'll also talk about Dr. B's fascinating work with the high-tech personalized nutrition company called Zoe. And again, be sure to check out his new book, The Fiber Fueled Cookbook. As a quick reminder before we jump in, if you're interested in getting the latest science of how to get your brain and body and unstuck, as well as exclusive information and updates from me, consider joining the thousands of people who have signed up for my newsletter. You can find it at my website, austinperlmutter.com backslash newsletter. And of course, if you enjoy the podcast, make sure to subscribe and share it with a friend. Okay, with that said, let's jump right in. Well, Will, I'm, I'm so excited we have a chance to uh, connect here. And, you know, I'm thrilled, obviously, with all the work that you've been doing with your voice in the, the wellness and the health space, which I think is desperately needed. And uh, yeah, just super excited to, uh, to talk about your new book and all the work that you've done. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Austin Perlmutter. I I'm honored to be here. And I, I feel, you know, the feelings are mutual. Um, it's uh, important, we were talking before we even started here about the importance of there being credible sources um, that people can lean on out there speaking publicly to the average person out there who needs to hear these messages. And so I, you know, kind of see you as we're on the same team here, and we're running out onto that battlefield screaming, trying to help out. So yeah, it is, it is a challenging time to try to put out uh, science-based messaging into the world. And, um, you know, I, I guess let's just jump right into this. Uh, I always want to know from a person's perspective how they got to the point of, of where they are uh, as far as why do they, why do you even care about doing this? What is your backstory that, that got you to this point and motivated you to be... <laughs> putting out this information into the world, getting up each day and being excited to try to educate other people on the role of health? I think that the people who do the best work, uh, this is not just in the health and wellness space, but just in life in general, the people who do the best work are people who are not um, being ultra cerebral about it, but instead are just being compelled by their passion and doing things that perhaps they don't even feel comfortable with, but yet they feel like they have to do this. And so during my life, uh, you know, I think it comes from a, an initial orientation. And truly, this is just who I am, that I felt like I needed to be a doctor. And the motivation was to heal people. And that has been there since I was a teenager. And I entered into, you know, undergraduate pre med. And this I started that journey when I was 18 years old, I never took a year off. And I emerged finally at age 34 able to call myself a fully functional, fully functioning independent doctor. And but on that individual journey, you know, I, 
I'm sure you're, you're the same as me, which is that I'm a very type A goal oriented person. So I'm constantly like building out these five year plans that I truly think are going to come to fruition. And the irony is that me being an author or a podcaster or Instagram guy or whatever you want to sort of assign uh, as my profile, that was never really my plan nor something that I desired to do. But um, some one of the things that I've discovered being, I guess, you know, getting kind of older now, I'm in my 40s, is that there have been these moments in my life where I feel like I'm being cursed when in fact I'm actually being blessed. Hmm. And you just yet, you don't yet have the vision of how this is going to play out to see how important this becomes in your life. And an example of that is about 10 years ago, I was in my early 30s and I was in my training. Uh, I was at the University of North Carolina for my GI fellowship. And, you know, I, I look in the mirror and here's this man who's 50 pounds overweight. The gut is sagging over the belt. Uh, the blood pressure pills are on the sink, cholesterol problems, anxiety problems, and like exceedingly low self-esteem, even though, you know, for my residency, I was at Northwestern, 60 brilliant colleagues of mine, and I win the highest award out of everyone. You know, my professional dreams were coming true beyond anything that I ever expected. But I was miserable. And I needed a change. And I tried to exercise my way out of it. And frankly, if I was able to easily fix my own health issues, I probably wouldn't be here today having this conversation. But I couldn't fix my health issues, despite really aggressive exercise programs, you know, an hour of strength training a day, plus 30 to 45 minutes of cardio. I mean, I could grow faster, I could get faster, I could swim further, I could lift stronger, but I couldn't lose the gut. And um, the pills and the procedures in my medical toolkit that I had been trained at these great institutions by mentors that I'm grateful for the way that they took me under their wing. But those those pills and procedures weren't going to fix my own issues. And so I needed something different. And ultimately, what completely changed my life was the discovery that the food that I, I had been eating, food that honestly, I loved, it tasted great. And it was extremely convenient in my fast paced life where I didn't have time for myself. But it was destroying my health. And when I discovered this and I started to make changes, I'll give you a quick example. I was in North Carolina. So like Hardee's is the fast food joint down there. And uh, for four bucks at Hardee's, I don't know if this is still true. Don't, don't quote me on this, but for four bucks back then, I could get a double cheeseburger. I'm pretty sure there was bacon on it <laughs> and a Andy chili cheese dog and fries and a beverage. Now I would get the Diet Coke because, hey, man, that's how you keep it healthy. Yeah, it's diet. <laughs> it's diet. It's got zero calories. Must be good. And um, and then they would throw in the apple pie. So that's four bucks, and that's like twenty five hundred calories. And instead of doing that, look, I was not going to go home and like cook a gourmet meal. I'm tired. I've been on call. I've been working eighteen hour days. So, but I did like have a blender, and a blender can be convenient. And I would just throw stuff in it and hit the button and it would buzz. And I would have like 36 ounces of smoothie and drink that. And then all of a sudden, like instantly, I'm feeling lighter. My energy levels are way up. I'm actually lifting an hour later as opposed to going to bed and feeling hungover. Um, and within a few days, my skin is clearing up. My hair is growing thicker. And over the course of months, the weight is melting off my body. The gut is no longer sagging over the belt. Eventually, the belt needs to be tightened. And it completely changed my life. And so I um, developed a ravenous appetite for nutritional research. Because I, I, I questioned, like, I, I trained at these great institutions, Georgetown, Northwestern, the University of North Carolina, why have I not been hearing about this? There must be nothing. 
And that couldn't be further from the truth. There were thousands of studies, high quality studies. And so, um, so I started studying at night. I would work all day, go home, study at night, and then bring it into the office the next day. And I'm treating people with irritable bowel syndrome and you know, helping to relieve their symptoms. I'm putting ul ulcerative colitis into remission. I'm taking acid reflux and people are throwing their proton pump inhibitors in the trash. And it became so powerful that I felt like this burden of, um, it is not fair or appropriate for me to keep this a secret. To be one-on-one -on -one behind a closed door is not adequate. Everyone deserves to hear this story. And so in 2016, I did something that felt very out of character for me because I'm not a social media guy, despite what people may see. Uh, I started my social media account, the Gut Health MD, and um, that ultimately through a series of events, like people truly didn't care for a couple of years, to be honest, but through a series of events that ultimately led to my book Fiber Fields coming out in May of 2020. It was a New York Times bestseller. It sold 200,000 copies in two years. It's a great book. And thank you. And now, you know, here I am uh, with, with, to be frank, some unfinished business because Fiber Fields got people excited and motivated to try to change their health. But I would have people, Austin, who would come into my clinic and sit in front of me and say, Dr. I loved your book. I want to eat the way you're describing, but I don't feel well when I do that. I don't know what to do because my food intolerances are stopping me. And so that's what motivated me to create my second book, The Fiber Fields Cookbook, where from my perspective, I am taking the individual person who has an individualized gut microbiome and I'm taking them by the hand and showing them a path that involves healing and optimizing the gut where you can overcome food intolerances. And so the book is a cookbook, but it's really designed uh, in a way that allows people to go beyond their food intolerances and actually take foods that they think are their enemy and make them their friend. Mm. There are so many things about that, which I love and can relate to. And I'll just say for people listening, I've had a, a chance to take a look at the cookbook already. And it's a just a beautiful thing. Um, I'll just echo the fact that there is there's a ton of science out there. There's a ton of nutritional science out there. And so much of the challenge is in converting that into actionables and recipes do that. Uh, at the end of the day, it's really interesting to know about signaling pathways in the body and the gut, but what do you do to make that happen? Uh, it's, it changes in the kitchen. And so the recipes are amazing. Congratulations on this release. It's a, it's a big deal. Um, I want to go back, though, to something that you mentioned that, that really hit me hard, which is hearing about your story in medical training and the idea of being unhealthy uh, almost as a result of the training programs that we go through to become health experts, to become doctors. Um, it's, it's super prevalent. I think it's something that, that we both have seen firsthand, and it's something that as far as I can tell, is still incredibly prevalent in the training system. And it's actually the reason I took a big trajectory change too, in that I felt like my mental health med school into residency was not good. And the support for stuff like that is uh, to quote, build resilience and to do these training programs that are supposed to somehow offset the fact that you are spending your life in a hospital, uh, divorced from reality, away from friends, away from family. And one of the things that has always been so striking to me is the fact that the food that is available in our medical centers is not actually designed or even remotely thought through uh, as it relates to uh, promoting health. Um, right. We have fast food restaurants in our hospitals, um, whether it's sandwich stores or pizza restaurants, burger restaurants, that is what is available. And so I guess I, I just want to make this point, which is for people who are listening, who are at any point in their medical trajectory is to just... It is a broken system for a number of reasons, but um, the idea that people who are going through the rigmarole to be able to help others, right, that's what a doctor does, but who aren't able to actively prioritize their own health, it's just messed up. And I don't really know that we have to talk more about it than that. It's just, it's something that very much bothers me because I see the epidemic of poor mental health in training physicians and in practicing physicians. And 
it, it's one of those things that really gets to me about current healthcare. Um, burnout rates are at an all time high. The formula of medical training is a formula for unhealthy doctors. Mm. Um, you are asking people to have completely disrupted sleep patterns, um, to work, you know, work, 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 uh, 18 hours a day. Sometimes I would do 30 hours in a row. I don't believe they're actually doing that anymore. I know there's been some, uh, <clears throat> some medical education rules that have changed since I left, but depends you know, on the specialty. I think, I think neurosurgery yeah, was still a hundred hour cap. That's true. That's true. Yeah. It does depend on the specialty and they can, and programs can get us an exception. Um, so, you know, ridiculous working, ridiculous hours all in a row, disrupted sleep patterns, um, no time for exercise, barely time to wash your underwear, honestly. Um, seriously, it's like crazy. I mean, there were times where I was like going out to the store to buy a new set of clothes because I didn't have anything that was clean and I didn't have time to do it. <laughs> and um, it's, and, you know, and then the attitude is toxic, right? I mean, it's sort of toxic where you're saying to people, suck it up. That's right. Be tougher. Yep. Be tougher. Right. Yep. And there are people I saw, there were people who I witnessed who were going through in hindsight, because I was chief medical resident at Northwestern. And so part of my responsibility was to have oversight for this group of people who are my peers, just a little bit younger than me. And um, I would see people who are clearly like struggling with mental health issues. And the, the scary part about that is that it did affect their, their job performance. And they're a medical doctor. And that requires not only other people to step up, but then like the response of the system tends to be not nurturing and supporting, but instead um, penalizing. Mm -hmm. And so it is, it's a, it's a complex topic. And, you know, I don't know how you feel about it, Austin, but this is the way that I would describe it for people who are not in healthcare. Um, I feel like it's a little bit similar to the way that I feel about my parents, which is that. I don't like, I, um, I value and respect the people, the doctors because they, and the nurses and all the other people involved because they really do care and they wouldn't be doing it if they did not. Cause I can just assure you that if you can get into medical school, you can probably get a banking job and there's a lot more money there. So, but it's like our, the way I feel about our parents where you wake up one day and you realize that they're not perfect. And you still love them, but you want to help. Uh, you want to help them be better, and our healthcare system needs to be better. And that's one of the things that you and I are trying to do mm. with these conversations. Yeah, I, I love that, and um, I, I think you know it's it is easier to go on the kind of tangent of saying everything is broken, but there's still so much about it that is. It's really just people showing up trying to help others, and to your point. There are a lot of other things that people could do with their time. And I, I think it, I would just echo this fact that it's not like you get into the hospital system or the clinic system and it's all just people who are, are in on this big conspiracy to take money. Every single person I know who works in healthcare is doing it because they want to help other people. Um, but yeah, I guess I'm glad we touched on it. Uh, I, I'd like to transition, go back to you know your I think area of both expertise and really where you are are known globally as uh, I think one of the best speakers on this subject, which is the gut health. And I, I think it is one of the the few areas that I have seen in the last decade that has really uh, morphed from what was primarily in academic journals, people talking about the possibility of, of microbes as playing a big role in human health, the possibility of things like short chain fatty acids as influencing health to really a, a, a very popular discussion in non-medical circles as to the gut playing a role in, in every aspect of everything. Um, so I think you are the perfect person to help bridge the gap and if you are going to say, here are the things that are, are most important to know about the gut, and here are some things that are maybe a bit sensationalized, do you have any tips for listeners as to where you would uh, put your stake in the ground? Um, all right. So the, the, what's happening with gut health to me is uh, really, truly sort of a, a, this is the new frontier of discovery. You know, uh, 200 years ago was, can we find the Pacific Ocean? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and right or you know there were different there's always been new frontiers um and you know 20 years ago is the internet now it's this and it's transforming the way we think about human biology and i think that the key what's challenging speaking like coming at it from a lay person's perspective is when you go to the internet there's so much so much information coming from so many sources how do you know what's what and what's real and for me it's not as tricky or challenging because this is what i've done for a living and i'm unique in that i've been a clinician but i've also been a researcher mm -hmm. and i've been, and i've been a patient and so for me i just go straight to the source material and the the research the published research is our source of truth it doesn't mean that it is an absolute truth it continues to evolve we continue to revise and do better but it is our compass that is pointing us and bringing us closer to the truth so i go there and for me i feel that my responsibility is not necessarily to take on everything that i believe to be true or not true but instead to take what i'm seeing in this source of truth and try to translate this into words that people, normal people can understand and then apply to their life in simple, in a simple way. So when I write these books, I'm writing a book that's coming at you trying to say, look, like you may not, you may not get this yet in your doctor's office because it's going to take time to infiltrate the healthcare system. But let me show you the way that you can approach these issues in your own life and potentially see improvement. Um, so, you know, I, are, there's areas of controversy and, uh, what I generally feel to be the case is that when we find areas of controversy, it's, it's usually that our research is kind of the half baked mm. and we haven't yet gotten, yet gotten to a place where we have that clarity that we need. And yet we're all very enthusiastic about taking this idea and wanting to bring it public. And so that's, that's why it becomes controversial or you hear different things is that we're not yet completely clear on what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Great answer. Um, if you were going to pitch the gut microbiome or just the gut in general to people who hadn't heard about it before, and you're going to say, Hey, listen, there's this thing. There's a couple of things you should know about it. What would you go to, to inspire people to be uh, interested in the subject? Here's this thing that we discovered. It's like actually truly a new organ. I mean, it really is. Mm -hmm. And yet it's um, the reason we didn't really see it or know it was there is because it's invisible. The, the naked eye is not capable of seeing it, but it is, tr it is as alive as you and I are. And it's just a question of like, are we zooming in or are we zooming out? If we had a microscope, we zoom in. And we see this community of microbes, there's 38 trillion of them living inside of us. And they have been a part of every single step of human history from the very beginning. There's never been a single second in the history of humanity that did not involve these microbes. And as a result, we grew to trust them. There is no doubt about it that we grew to trust these microbes because we have asked them to actually take responsibility for very, very important parts of human health. And those include our digestion, which is our access to nutrients. That's like literally life, our life force. Um, our immune system, 70% of the immune system is like literally separated from our gut microbiome by a single layer of cells that's so fine that the naked eye is not capable of seeing it. Our, our metabolism, um, our hormones, our mood, our brain health, and even the expression of the human genetic code is in part influenced by these microbes. And so when you think about this, this is like, these are the pillars of human health. And what I'm saying is that the most important part of what like makes us healthy humans may be the part of us that's not even human, hmm. not even a part of our body. It's these gut microbes. And I think that the, the exciting thing about it is that this community, this ecosystem living inside of us is not something that we are born with and stuck with for the rest of our life. It is adaptable. It can be shaped. You can make choices that are simple choices and sensible choices, nothing crazy and over the top that allow you to actually transform 
this community and turn it into something that basically is an engine designed to power your health. Mm. And so that to me is what's really exciting. I, I love that so much. Uh, I think to your last point, super exciting to know that the microbiome changes dynamically as a reflection of what we do in a given day, as opposed to, you know, granted our cells turn over very quickly as well, but um, that dietary choices can influence the microbiome, which influences, just like you said, so many aspects of our health. Um, I wanted to, to kind of go into one of the things you mentioned, which is that the majority of the immune system seems like it's located in and around the gut lining. And I think there's, for obvious reasons, a lot of conversations about the immune system in the last few years, and it's largely moved towards a bathe yourself in Purell and, uh, you know, kill all the bugs uh, mentality. But when you, you factor in the fact that these microbes uh, in the microbiome, not all of them, but some of them seem directly related to our, our being healthy, happy people, um, any thoughts on maybe why we should reframe our, our immune microbe connection through the, the lens of the gut? Yeah, I, I think this is a great question. And, and clearly, I, I, I do believe that we need to reframe this conversation. And I think it comes back to, so um, I am turning into my dad. <laughs> which basically means that I'm becoming very curious about uh, studying history. And if we go back and take a historical look at this, what we will discover is that if you and I were having this exact same co conversation, granted it would not be over Zoom, 100 years ago, right? What you and I as both medical doctors would be talking about is that the top causes of death are all coming from infections. Mm -hmm. 100 years ago, the top three causes of death were all infections. Heart disease and cancer did exist, but they were not the principal concerns that medical doctors had. And perhaps, I mean, actually, I would argue not even perhaps, from my perspective, the clear most um, major breakthrough in uh, medical therapy ever was the discovery of penicillin. Mm -hmm. It was a complete game changer. It occurred in World War II, and all of us um, actually live longer, healthier lives as the result of the discovery of antibiotics that allow us to fight back against uh, infections. But the problem is that when you come from this place of, oh my gosh, penicillin is so powerful and so good. And oh my gosh, everyone is dying of infections. When you come from that place, it becomes very natural to just kind of vilify the entire cohort of microbes and act as if they're all inherently bad. Like we say the word bacteria and in our minds, the connotation is this is a bad thing. Germs. Germs, right? <laughs> exactly. So, and you know, when in fact, the vast majority of these microbes that include bacteria and fungi and, and um, for many of us, archaea, these microbes are actually good and they are there with an intention that is to help you be a healthier human. And when we go on a mission to destroy microbes, because that's what the 20th century taught us that we were supposed to do, when we do that, then we actually are causing like uh, collateral harm to the good guys. You can't, you know, you can't uh, drop napalm into this community of microbes and only take out the bad guys. That doesn't exist. And this would be something like an antibiotic? Yeah, when we take an antibiotic, we're affecting all of them. But it's that's our dietary our dietary choices too, you know, and it's the things that we put on our skin, and the things that we put in our mouth, like when we brush our teeth or the water that we're drinking. All of these different things can potentially affect microbes, and so um, it's no coincidence that we have seen the explosion of immune mediated disorders that include allergic diseases, allergic diseases meaning like asthma, seasonal allergies, where your immune system is actually actually reacting to something external to your body that it's not supposed to. Mm -hmm. um, and we've seen the explosion of autoimmune diseases, autoimmune meaning that your immune system is so confused that it's actually attacking you because it's decided that you are the enemy. And when I was writing Fiber Fuel, my first book, Austin, I became curious, like, what is the evidence that there is injury to the microbiome? Because again, I mentioned this a moment ago, but just to repeat, 38 trillion microbes separated 
from 70% of the immune system by a single layer of cells that we call the epithelial layer. And so the question was, are they intertwined? And what I've discovered is that as of the writing fiber field, every single autoimmune and allergic disease in which they had studied what was going on in the gut microbiome, every single one of them, the answer was the gut is abnormal. Mm. The gut has been harmed. When you disrupt the gut, the word that I would use is dysbiosis, but some out there might call this, call this leaky gut. And we're basically mm -hmm. talking about the same thing. What we have is a loss of the good guys, the enrichment of the bad guys, and the injury to the lining of the intestine, such that there's basically like, it's like you're creating holes in the lining of the intestine. Mm -hmm. And now you can sneak things across this barrier. Well, those things that are sneaking across the barrier are now coming into contact with our immune cells. And it's no coincidence that this is something that I think about. I'd be curious to hear what you think about this coming from your perspective. If we think about the foods that are the most associated with an allergic reaction, so I'm going to list them, all right? And they include, because I, I want people to think about these foods in the context of what are the foods that we're eating these days. So the foods include dairy, eggs, fish and shellfish, wheat, corn, soy, peanuts, and tree nuts. Mm -hmm. First of all, I'm very proud of myself that I got through that. Yeah, it's <laughs> impressive. It's impressive. Um, but like, think about this. Think about the foods that I just mentioned. And tell me what are the most common foods that you will discover in ultra processed foods? Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think and I just, don't think it's a coincidence. Well, so it's something that, that came up for me, maybe with the exception of something like a shellfish, is that these are also the foods that have been most heavily modified on the front end as well, right? So the, the eggs that people are consuming, the meats people are consuming, the corn and certainly the soy, I mean, these are among the highest GMO types of foods. And they've been heavily modified such that they are not the same versions that our ancestors ate a long time ago as well. But to your point, absolutely. I mean, these are things that have been added to just about every, especially if you start adding in corn derivatives like high fructose corn syrup, they're just in everything. Yeah. And, and, and I think that part of it too is like not just zeroing in on these foods. And because by the way, I'm not vilifying these foods. In fact, many of the foods that I just described, I do believe that people can eat in the proper mm -hmm. form. That's the nuance of it. Um, but instead, what I'm saying is that um, it, when you think about these foods and the way that they are being combined into a larger food mm -hmm. that is this processed food and being, it, it is a vehicle that is delivering something to your body. And I don't think it's a coincidence that then your immune system becomes confused when you have wheat that's being sprayed with glyphosate, mm -hmm. when you have genetically modified the soy and the corn to be glyphosate tolerant. And it's not just the glyphosate thing. There's other chemicals too. There's 10,000 additives in our food system. Mm. Yeah. And we don't know what's what. Yeah, it's it's so important, and I think uh, one of one of the themes that that comes up for me a lot in in my podcasting and just in general is trying to add some nuance to the conversation where it's not that bugs are bad, meaning microbes are bad, and it's not that all microbes are good. Uh, but if we start to appreciate the fact that we have been, as you said, living in this relationship with these microbes since the start of time and that we need them for digestion, we need them for the synthesis of everything from neurotransmitters to metabolites that influence our brains. There's really no getting around the idea that our interventions, whether antibiotics or otherwise, are uh, they're pretty broad stroke and pretty uh, nonspecific, so that we have to be paying attention to the outcomes of that. Um, and I wanted to focus in too on on the immune piece, uh, as you described, you know, epidemic rates of autoimmune diseases that seem to have increased, not just as a reflection of an increase in the population, but in prevalence. So a number of people who are having them uh, in our population or percentage, um, allergic diseases, similar kind of thing. And um, what was super interesting for me, uh, and I know something that you know far better than I do is this immune gut connection and that the immune cells are actively receiving signals in the gut from our food, from whatever's happening in the microbes in the gut, and that that kind of induces them to a level of tolerance 
where if they're more tolerant, they can handle, or your body can handle foods that might otherwise cause problems in certain people, or might overall be a more tolerant immune system that doesn't react against uh, the environment, which would be an allergy or to itself, which is the autoimmune system or the autoimmune disease. And so the idea that you're educating your immune cells with your food uh, through the gut microbiome, through the gut cells just seems so powerful when everyone's talking about these things like vitamin C that's going to boost your immune system and fix everything. Whereas in a typical day, all of these nutrients, um, and maybe we could talk a little bit about you know, the micros, macros, and, and maybe to some extent, the phytonutrients and how those might be able to influence our, our gut and secondarily our immune health. But I'll pause there. Well, I just wanted to point out because this is this is I, I want to put into action for people mm -hmm. what you and I are talking about, which which is that let me show you how the gut microbiome. So, because to date I've just been kind of describing how there's this association. Let me show you how powerfully manipulating the gut microbiome can be in terms of affecting our immune cell, our, our immune system. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, uh, first, let me talk about cancer therapy. All right. So specifically melanoma research coming out of MD Anderson right now, MD Anderson, you know, clearly a top three mm -hmm. cancer center in the United States. And basically, typically when they treat melanoma, which by the way, is the number one most deadly form of skin cancer, they will um, use often a type of therapy called immunotherapy, and it's helping to shape the immune system in the fight against the cancer. All right. Now, what's interesting is a, a few years ago, they stumbled into the discovery that patients who were receiving antibiotics prior to immune therapy were having worse health outcomes, were less likely to survive the therapy and get good results. And at first they said, oh, well, they're just sicker patients. But then when they actually studied it and they, formed, they created a, stu a study to look at this specifically, removing the, the sort of intensity of the illness they discovered it continued to be true. If you give antibiotics prior to immune therapy, the immune therapy is less effective. Then they said, well, what if we give a fecal transplant? If it is the microbiome, because that's what they were inferring, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what if we give a fecal transplant? And they discovered that if you give a fecal transplant from a healthy donor prior to immune therapy, people get better results. And now just recently in December of uh, 2021, in the journal Science, one of the top scientific journals on the planet, mm -hmm. they published new data where they looked at, this is, by the way, this was not a randomized trial. They're now actively doing a randomized trial, but they took a retrospective look at what people were eating. And they separated based upon fiber intake. High fiber consumers, which by the way, was in their study, only 20 grams of fiber per day. And I, I'll just comment that the recommended amount of fiber for a woman is 25 grams per day. Mm -hmm. And for a man is 38 grams per day. So these like high fiber consumers actually were in many cases deficient in fiber. Um, but nonetheless, when they studied this, they found that the people who were consuming 20 or more grams of fiber per day had significantly improved survival and significantly improved um, disease-free intervals from their melanoma. They were basically fighting off the cancer. And when they analyzed it in more detail, every five grams of fiber intake led to a 30% increased likelihood of survival. Incredible. That's incredible. Absolutely. Now, just to explain for, because I know that you uh, know this, um, Austin, but for the people at home who are like, well, why fiber? Why is that mm -hmm. so important? The answer is that when you consume fiber, fiber, we as big, strong humans, we actually lack the enzymes to process ourselves. So it's led to some people on the internet saying, well, fiber has no use in human health. Like it, it just goes out the other end. Heard that that's one a few times. True. Yeah, uh, that's not actually true. Our gut microbes have the enzymes where we lack the enzymes, a single cellular bacteria may have hundreds of them. Mm. And as a cohort, like as an entire group, they work actually as a team, dissecting and breaking down fiber. And fiber becomes their food. It enters into the colon, comes in contact with your microbiome, they eat it, they grow stronger, and then they transform it. And it's like a beautiful, magical thing because what emerges are, and I believe we may want to talk about this, uh, something that I would describe as a postbiotic, 
Mm -hmm. And that are the, they are the short chain fatty acids. So fiber, just to uh, kind of jump into prebiotics, probiotics, and postbiotics. People hear about probiotics, and they associate that with a capsule that you take. Well, probiotics basically mean any bacteria that has been demonstrated to have human health benefits. And you have them living inside of you right now. But those bacteria are not really valuable unless they are creating something for you. And if you want them to be creators, you need to give them the right resources. Those are the prebiotics. The prebiotics are food for your microbes that have been demonstrated to have health benefits. Fiber is a prebiotic. And so when you combine fiber, the prebiotic, with the probiotic bacteria, they can actually create these short-chain fatty acids, which are the postbiotics. And these short-chain fatty acids, one of the effects that they have is that they actually go to these immune cells that are right there across that layer of cells, that are right there, and actually help to shape these immune cells by activating what are called T regulatory cells. T regulatory cells are basically keeping your immune system in check so that it doesn't get out of whack. You don't want it to be too much. You don't want it to be too little. You want it to be just right, targeted, and precise. And so, so it's quite fascinating to ponder that these ideas that we've had about the role of dietary fiber, how it creates short chain fatty acids, which by the way, do many other health uh, uh, benefiting things, including like reversing leaky gut. But it's quite fascinating to, to ponder that in a cancer study, yeah, a high fiber diet could like literally save a person's life. That's crazy. It's, it's powerful stuff. And I just want to reiterate this idea that, uh, well, fiber isn't digested by our cells, so it's, it's worthless, right? Maybe it's going to make my bowel movements easier, but what else is there? And research like the one, the study you just mentioned in science, which again, is, is it's a pretty solid uh, journal, is indicating that these pathways are super important. And you're reprogramming your immune cells based on what you eat because of what your microbiome is doing. Really, really interesting stuff. Um, one question I did want to ask you, because I think you're you're perfectly, uh, I think, positioned to be able to answer it is, I think, similar to what we've seen with uh, the ketogenic diet and people trying to create uh, exogenous ketones that you can take a shot or two of ketones and start off your day. There's also been a lot of emphasis on uh, now postbiotics or short chain fatty acids, things that we might be able to do to, to augment that, but maybe that bypass a lot of these steps that um, you know, the traditional step would be you eat something with fiber, your microbes break down the fiber, you create these products in your body, like these short chain fatty acids. Um, but wondering here, your thoughts on kind of picking one piece of that. So if a person was to say, I just want the short chain fatty acids, I don't want to have to deal with all of the other eating of the fiber and microbiome. You think that's a good plan? I just don't think you can take shortcuts. I don't think that that's the way our body works. I, I know that people want that, um, mm -hmm. but it kind of goes back to the guy that I was in my early thirties where, you know, I thought if I exercise enough, then I can eat whatever the heck I want mm -hmm. and get away with it. And that proved to not be true. And so I, I think that, you know, at the end of the day, when it comes to um, these questions, we don't yet have clear evidence that taking a butyrate supplement, for example, is the same as consuming fiber. We have overwhelming evidence for fiber. Mm -hmm. And so I say we stick with what we know until we have really strong evidence to prove otherwise, or not, not to prove otherwise, but to uh, create an alternative option. Mm -hmm. Now, it's kind of interesting that you brought up uh, the ketogenic diet because um, the ketogenic diet, I, I, I feel that we need more research into, I mean, I fr frankly, I welcome more research on all of these topics that we're discussing today. But one of the things that I do think is kind of interesting and compelling about the ketogenic diet, and I'm not actually um, uh, arguing that this is the path that everyone should take, but I do think it's interesting because the ketones are actually beta hydroxy butyrate. Right. right. And so I think what we're seeing in people who start on a standard American diet, so the standard American diet is 10% plants, 60% ultra processed foods. So like six times more calories from stuff that didn't exist 100 years ago than actual real plants. 
and then it's 30% animal products. And if you take a person who's on that level of an unbalanced diet and you give them a ketogenic diet, they're going from a state of being completely fiber deprived. And most of their, not, you know, most of their dietary cal calories coming from food that I would describe as unhealthy. And they're instead shifting to a diet that at least they get the beta hydroxybutyrate, which I believe is helping to fulfill in times like it's in, really intended that it's the body's me mechanism of protecting us during times of starvation where we still have the fulfillment of, of what our bodily needs are. So the beta hydroxybutyrate is there. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I think it's kind of interesting to think about that. So I'd like to, to jump back into this ketogenic diet conversation. It, it's one that for a number of reasons, I've been kind of peripherally involved with over the last years. And I think like, like many things, uh, there was a pretty big bandwagon effect early on with this is going to solve our problems. And I really love what you're saying as far as if you deviate from the standard American diet, which is junk, it's, it's, let's just call it what it is, it's crap, you're probably going to have some health benefits. And the ketogenic diet or really any diet is by definition a deviation from this. But um, something that I, I really like about what you recommend with diet is that we're not always talking about an intervention here. That's a couple of weeks. That's a month for a specific condition. Granted, you do talk about this in your book, but it's talking about sustainable dietary choices that are going to lead to longer term health over the lifespan. So I'd love to hear your thoughts specifically on, on how keto diff is different from what you would recommend the average person eat for health. Yeah. Well, so I think that, you know, keto to me, again, it's, it's as you said, you, you step away from the standard American diet and almost any diet is an improvement. But the question is, are you making compromises with the dietary choice that you've just taken on? And is this something that you're going to be able to stick with? And what I've observed is that the majority of people who enter into a ketogenic diet, they struggle to actually maintain that level of intensity where they actually are mm -hmm. achieving ketosis. Mm -hmm. And if you're not achieving ketosis, then I think that's potentially compromising the benefits. But the other issue is, you know, let me say this, Austin, I believe that it is possible to craft a, a healthy form of the ketogenic diet. I think it's possible, but that's like, a person who has a very high level understanding of nutrition. And that is not the way that the average ketogenic diet is being implemented in the United mm -hmm. States, where people are just quite simply cutting carbs. Yeah. And the problem is that fiber is a carb. And so unless you know to actually like get sources of fiber that will fulfill your bodily needs, including your gut microbiome needs, then most likely when you do it, when you move towards a ketogenic diet, what you're doing is you're cranking up the dietary fat and you're simultaneously cutting your carbs, but you're inadvertently cutting out good carbs. Yeah, that's right. And so there was an interesting study that came out because we were talking a moment ago about the immune system. Mm -hmm. And the, the second part of this, I was talking about cancer, but actually in my new book, I talk a, a bit about the interaction between our immune system, our microbiome and COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And uh, to accelerate through a couple years of clinical research and what we've found, here's what we know. We know that the gut microbiome is different in a person who has COVID-19. And those differences are more uh, clear when the severity of disease is worse. So worse disease, worse change to the gut microbiome. What's actually missing in the microbiome are the butyrate producing microbes. People are not getting enough of those. And when they went to study diet, so this, this would infer that butyrate is important and butyrate could potentially protect us from having severe COVID-19. Because of course, we've been trying to figure out, you know, why is it that some people end up in the hospital on a respirator and some people like have the sniffles, barely know that they have it. And so they, they took a group of um, first line front, uh, uh, first line healthcare workers from six different countries. And this was predating the availability of a vaccine. And they looked at their exposure to COVID-19 and their subsequent health outcomes. And what were they eating? And it was fascinating because what they discovered is that among people who were consuming a plant-based diet, again, high in fiber, 
there was a 73% reduction in moderate to severe COVID-19. And if you run a pescatarian diet, which basically means like high fiber plus fish, there was a 59% reduction in moderate to severe COVID-19. But the group that actually did the worst in the study were the, were the doctors that were on a low carb diet. Hmm. And if you were on a low carb diet compared to a person on a plant-based diet, you were nearly four times more likely to get moderate to severe COVID-19. Why? Because again, I think that the problem is that people who go onto these diets are not doing them in a healthy form and they're reducing their fiber intake and they're making compromises with their health. So from my perspective, rather than looking for quick fixes and shortcuts and fast weight loss, I instead believe that it, this is about small changes, taking your starting point wherever you are and doing one thing at a time and doing it repeatedly with consistency and then taking it one step further and continuing to build. And by building, you are making progress. And when you make progress and it's done in a sustainable way, then actually you're creating habits. And then when you create habits, these things that it sounds like, oh, well, Dr. B is asking me to remember to do a thousand different things. Well, no, actually, because you've made it a habit, you don't even think about it anymore. You just do. And you yeah. just live. And now this is your lifestyle. Yeah. Love that. Love that. One of my uh, previous guests on the podcast was uh, Dr. Wendy Wood, who did some of the initial research on habit formation. And this is exactly in line with that, which is uh, the way that our brains are able to transfer our actions into long-term habits is by doing things that are easy, that we can reproduce, and that are enjoyable. And those are not things that are in sync with many of the diets you'll see on magazines, TV shows, which promote a, a month of something crazy and then a 30-pound weight loss. And as you know better than I, uh, weight loss is one of the big things people care about. And yet when you look at basically every diet that promotes really rapid weight loss, people tend to gain it back again. And I think it does kind of come back to this idea of what are the targets with the food that we eat? And, you know, I, I'm increasingly trying to pay attention to the role of uh, regenerative agriculture, of soil health, of uh, the ecosystem and, and how our food choices shape that. Um, and it, it seems that there is a parallel here and the dietary choices that may be best for us are the ones that are best for kind of others for the community. And that community is the larger world ecosystem, but also the microbes within us. And unless we're actively looking at how we can care for those things, when we're choosing our foods, we're probably not going to achieve many of the results that I guess are, are most important in our long-term health. So I know we're kind of getting towards the end here, but uh, I'd love to know if you have any thoughts on kind of the interaction here between uh, our microbiome and the microbiome and the, the world around us and whether that's something people need to be paying attention to. I mean, I think uh, I, uh, in my training, would find myself uh, shocked when all of a sudden somebody showed up a bunch of C. diff in their gut and we say, how did that get there? And you think, uh, well, it must have been introduced at some point and and slowly starting to realize that there is this larger community of microbes that lives all around us on the people we're with, the pets we're with, um, and the cats that live in our, in our homes. Uh, and, and whether I guess that has reframed the way that you uh, see the interaction between our microbes and our health. I, I, I take a more holistic view. I've stopped. I, I, I don't think of myself as a holistic practitioner necessarily. Um, I am a gastroenterologist, but I acknowledge that the reason that I'm a gastroenterologist is because there's such complexity to medicine that it's quite overwhelming. And you ultimately have to choose what you, where you want to focus your attention and energy to really build expertise in that arena. That's the limitation of the human mind. That's the limitation of my mind. I wish I could be all things in medicine and not just, um, not just a GI doctor, but, uh, with regard to this, though, the gut does not operate separately from the rest of the body. The, um, the gut is intertwined with our mind, with our immune system, with our heart, um, our lungs. I mean, you could just go down the line, every single organ, they're communicating with one another right now. So there's an interconnectedness to everything that we need to acknowledge and accept. And at the same time, we are not creatures of isolation we are interconnected with the world that surrounds us. 
our gut microbiome is actually reflected in these things. And I don't just mean our food. And I don't just mean sleep and exercise. But I mean also your home and the people that you live with. So as a um, quick example, Austin, you know, there's really, uh, we, don't, we don't talk about it enough, but there's quite fascinating data on longevity as it relates to interconnectedness mm-hmm. and how social we are. And if you think about it, you know, because we talk about food so much, but um, if you think about it, like if you want to torture a person, you isolate them. And if you want happy humans, you surround them with others who lift them up and who support them and tell them that they're loved because then they feel very grounded, very safe. And then you have, this is how you create a healthy human. It's, it's so, our relationships are so important. And they studied this. There's so many studies that I would love to talk about here, but in the interest of just being focused, I'm just going to bring forward one where they took a look at the shared microbiome among people who were cohabitating and discovered that, first of all, um, you know, for example, I, I'm married, so with my wife, we share more microbes than I would share with my siblings. So even though that I have a shared genetic code, a shared origin, you know, from my mom with my brothers, I actually will share more microbes with my wife. And you could say, oh, well, it must be that you're eating the same food. And they actually controlled for that in the research and discovered that this, these changes, these similarities were despite us eating the same food. Now, here's my favorite part about this. They, they discovered that there was actually a difference in terms of shared microbes based upon the nature of the relationship that you have with your spouse. Mm. Some people are very happily married and some are not. And they discovered that those who were happily married were sharing more microbes together than those who were on the rocks or on the out. And um, now is that because they're kissing and touching and intimate together? Um, Or is that when we are happy, then we are, you know, when we are socially connected, then we feel safe we feel comfortable and it takes away part of our sympathetic drive and it takes away part of our sort of constant baseline stress response. And, you know, research actually shows us Austin that to to kind of bring in the the brain gut connection here, um, that when we feel stressed, our brain will release a hormone from the pituitary gland called CRH corticotropin releasing hormone that basically will initiate a cascade of events that if you follow this waterfall as it comes down, at the bottom of it, you will discover that it induces damage to the gut. And this explains why in times of acute stress, many of us will manifest digestive symptoms, whether it be bloating Mm -hmm. or cramping or diarrhea, Um, that stress can actually injure or impair the gut. Well, uh, I'll just say that the most challenging patients that I've had in my career the people who fail with other doctors and ultimately have come to see me are the people who um, it's not their food or sleep or exercise. It's that there is something that's going on in their life that is unsettled. That is perpetually activating this stress response. And as a result, we creating a constant um, suppression of the health of the gut microbiome that they simply can't overcome with food. Hmm. And so this is, this is where I feel like, you know, I kind of took a couple turns there, but you know, it, I feel that it's important for people to understand that interconnectedness with our environment and how we feel about ourselves and are we at peace? These are important questions because ultimately they have a major impact on the health of our gut. Yeah. And so, it's all interconnected. It's it's powerful stuff. It's powerful stuff. And I mean, I guess I, I would just want people to to understand because a lot of my podcasts and a lot of my stuff is focused on mental health and the the desire for for the audience to understand that it's not mind and then body. And when you talk about this integration between gut and brain, microbiome and brain, um, it makes it pretty clear 
uh, one of the things that has fascinated me is the bi-directionality of that and thinking about, so our thoughts can change the health of our gut, but also through what seems to be uh, a largely vagus nerve mediated uh, communication that what happens in the gut gets transferred up through the vagus nerve and the firing rate tells the brain how to process stress. So uh, I'm not sure if that's something that, uh, does, does that sound right to you? you I know you, uh, you talk a lot about kind of that bi-directionality of the gut brain axis, but do you think that the gut can also influence our brain health, our mental health, just as our, our mental health influences our gut? I think that's undeniable. I think it's undeniable that our gut influences our, our, our brain health. That includes our mood, that includes our cognitive function. Um, I think that there are many different ways in which the gut is actively communicating to the brain right now. It's kind of like, look, you can talk to a person by phone or you can text message to them or you can send smoke signals if you want to. <laughs> you know, the gut is the gut has these different approaches, but all of them ultimately are relaying messages upstairs to the brain. And this is why they're, you know, basically um, intertwined and inseparable. And so like speaking to the vagus nerve, just for the listeners at home, um, we're talking about one nerve, but you have to understand this one nerve, this is actually branched out into millions of nerves. Mm -hmm. Second most, the second most nerves in the entire body actually are found in the gut. And you actually have more nerves there than you do in the spinal cord. And so, and it's constantly feeling and sensing and collecting this information, but also your gut creates neurotransmitters. 90% of serotonin is produced in the gut. There's over 30 neurotransmitters produced in the gut. Now, the serotonin, for those who have heard of serotonin, they're kind of like, what is that again? Serotonin is the happy hormone. It affects our mood. It affects our energy levels. When we treat people with medications for depression or anxiety, we give them drugs that boost serotonin levels. In the gut, serotonin helps with our motility which is why these drugs can also be used to improve people with motility disorders. And I've used them in my practice for that. Serotonin from the gut doesn't actually cross the blood brain barrier. So it doesn't directly affect mood, but there are precursor molecules called 5-HT that actually do cross the blood brain barrier are one of the ways in which the gut can potentially affect the mood. And then the last thing that I would mention is we'll come back to the short chain fatty acids that we get from fiber. The short chain fatty acids spread throughout the entire body. They don't just uh, have an effect in the gut itself. They actually jump into the bloodstream and they will travel up to the brain. And your brain has a barrier, just like your gut has a barrier. So we call this the blood brain barrier. And what's interesting is people can have leaky gut and in leaky gut, there's the breakdown of proteins called the tight junction proteins. Well, guess what? In the brain and the blood brain barrier, we have the exact same proteins, the tight junction proteins. And when a person comes to the doctor and says, I have brain fog, the doctor typically rolls their eyes because they don't really know what to make of that. I'm telling you right now what it is. This is leaky brain. And these tight junction proteins that break down Butyrate has the ability to repair those proteins, both in the gut and also in the brain. So the short chain fatty acids are part of the way in which your gut is able to communicate and affect the change in the, in the brain. So we know that food affects mood. That's very clear. Um, we also know that if you look at people who have mood disorders, generalized anxiety disorder, major depression, you will actually see alteration and disturbance of the gut microbiome. And where we are, Austin, is trying actually to connect the dots on this sequence and have a more complete understanding of exactly how food affects mood. Because, you know, as a quick example, um, there's someone at the Food and Mood Center in Australia. Her name is Professor Felice Jacka. And she did a study called the SMILES trial. And she showed significant improvement in depression with diet changes. And it was a uh, effectively a Mediterranean diet that they were offering. So high in plants, high in polyphenols. And um, so we know that the data is there, but what we're actively working on, I'm actually part of a personalized nutrition company called Zoe. And we, we actually do clinical research studies. And we're actually looking at right now, what is the food that people eat? How does it affect their microbes? And then how does it ultimately downstream affect their mood? 
we want to actually connect the dots all the way from the start to the finish to have a more complete understanding of this picture and these sort of um, relationships that exist between food, microbes, and mood. Love that. Yeah. And I'll be closely following because I think this is, these are the connections that people are looking for to both substantiate the science, but also to show uh, how we can be a bit more personalized about recommendations. Um, I mean, in my case, you know, I, I like fermented foods and I'm going to do my best to get in my fibers, but could it be that certain fibers, certain types of microbes, certain types of exercise, sleep, and other patterns are influencing this? I, I think yes, but we don't know enough to, at least I don't know enough to be able to, to customize it. Well, so th this is the future. This is the, this is the future. And this is why I'm involved with this company because the problem is that, and this is just the, um, the nature of our clinical research, which is that we we put randomized controlled trials on a pedestal as the best. That's the gold standard is what we say, right? But there's a problem, which is that in a randomized controlled trial, you are looking at average outcomes, not individual outcomes. And so, you know, you, you and I have both experienced where a drug will work extremely well for one patient. And then another patient gets no response or has an adverse effect. And if, gosh, if we could only predict like how to go about doing that. So, well, the answer I think is in part our, it's not in, it's not, it's not the whole picture, but it is in part our gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. It's completely individualized. There's like, there's 8 billion people on this planet. There's only one person on this planet that has your gut microbiome. And if you literally had an identical twin, they could actually be the exact same genetic code from the exact same family. They would still only share about 35 or 37% of the same microbes as you. Incredible. So Incredible. the next level to me is us being able to create personalized recommendations. And the way that we do that is the way that we're going about it with Zoe, which is that um, you, you can't do it with 10 people. You need 10,000 people. And we are currently at 20,000 people where every single one has submitted their microbiome, uh, a continuous glucose monitor, their blood lipids, and then they enter into an app what they're eating. And you put all of this information into a supercomputer and you allow it to run complex machine learning algorithms. And when it's done, rather than saying, hey, the average result is this, it instead says, Austin, we analyzed your gut microbiome. And based upon that in combination with your continuous glucose monitor data, your blood lipid data, here's actually the foods that work and fit best with your personal metabolism. So that's not, hey, let's restrict your food. That's instead, let's just empower you with an understanding of what the foods are that work best for you. And now you can gravitate naturally towards those foods. And it's not that you eliminate the other ones. It's more that you are gravitating more naturally to stuff that is a natural fit for your mm. body and the way your body works. It, it is transforming then the food that we eat as just kind of a general health intervention to a specific intervention based on the results of our, our personal microbiome. I mean, it's, it's food becomes a medical intervention and it's so exciting. I am, I'm thrilled to hear about this and I'm thrilled to hear that you are actually using larger data sets I think, as you said, uh, so much of the benefit we get here comes from allowing the computers to make connections that, that we as humans can't quite do. So I'll, I'll be thrilled to, uh, to stay up to date on that because I think that that sounds like a revolutionary next step for people trying to improve their health who are otherwise getting relatively generic recommendations. Well, and I think part of what makes it really cool is that, first of all, this is not um, sponsored by a drug company that's trying to bring a, a drug product to market. And frankly, the NIH is never going to pay for something like this because they don't have it in their budget and it's too expensive. What's cool is that a community of people can come together. This is not just like the scientists are worthless if we're the only ones doing this. We need the community, right? And then the community comes together and you get 10, 20, 100,000 people, a million people. And now like you participating, you might be helping someone who lives in London by contributing your data, right? But then someone who lives in Alaska is helping you. And it's like, that. this is how we create um, networks that actually lead to greater good and help us to better understand individual people and their response to food. Love it.
Love it. This is this is so amazing to hear. Well, Will, I, I, I so appreciate your time. I obviously very much appreciate your work. And it's always amazing to hear the depth of what people are up to. And that's certainly the case in what you're up to. Uh, so many cool projects. So I, I want to come back here to one of the reasons that we have a chance to talk today, which is, again, you're putting out this amazing new cookbook filled with these both science and recipes, which I appreciate. Um, and so by the time you're listening to or watching this, it should be available, but if not, it will be available for pre-order and I have looked at it. It's excellent. So thank you so much for all of your work and for continuing to find all of these ways to, uh, both do the research and meet the, the public, I think where they're at with things that are, are helpful on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's been an honor getting to talk to you on the show. It's been an honor getting to follow you and all of your work. So thank you for coming on the get the stuck out podcast. Uh, I, th I thank you for having me on. It was, I mean, I, I feel the same way about you and I love your work and, um, you know, it's, it's great because I feel like you and I, we are just getting started. And so I look forward to many opportunities in the future for us to continue to connect and work together and collaborate and do what we can to get out there and help people improve their health and lead healthier lives using, you know, being empowered with information that really can make a difference. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, enjoy the rest of your day and thanks again for coming on. Thanks so much. So thanks for checking out the episode this week. Again, if you've enjoyed this content, feel free to check out my newsletter. It's austinperlmutter.com backslash newsletter. And make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you can get updates when there are new episodes. If you'd like to check out Dr. B's stuff, his website is theplantfedgut.com. And that's also where you can find information about all of his work, including his new cookbook. Thanks again for watching or listening, and I'll see you next time.